My name is Chris Beecher. I'm a firefighter. I've been on the department for nine and a half years. My name is Brian DePondi. I'm a firefighter during the day for the career department, and I'm a lieutenant for the call department. My name is Ed McCamlish. I'm a lieutenant here with East Elemental Fire Department, and I've been a firefighter for a total of uh, just over 15 years. My name is Michael Minahan. I am a firefighter, um, and I've been on the department for four and a half years. We were lucky enough to be invited to get an inside look about what happened in the department and speak to some of the firefighters. The East Elmetto Fire Department responds not just to fires, but to car crashes, hazmat incidents, and carbon monoxide calls as well. The department will be staffed by nine people, including the chief, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., 365 days a week. The new hours come into effect later in 2015 when training has been completed. sit in what we call the alarm room um, to help with the dispatch functions. They provide us with uh, updated information uh, and they're also there to um, assist us in additional resources. My expectations for the firefighters are to do the best they can, um, to continue to train, to, uh, to keep their head in the game, it, it, it's, it is, it's a great job, it's a fun job, but it, you know, when you're at a call, you gotta keep, you know, you're focused on your job at hand, and, and I work with some great guys during the day and at night, and everybody's focused. When, when there's a job to do, you're focused. Drill nights are the first and third Tuesdays of the month, and they usually run a couple hours a piece. There's usually a quick officers meeting beforehand, and then it's you know, for the entire department. A um, couple hours after that. Occasionally we have special drills at night, depending if we get the fire academy to run a program here or if we're running CPR and first aid training. Uh, my expectations are that uh, call firefighters and career fighters all you know, attend the drills you know, first and foremost, and also everybody participates to 100% in the drills. Uh, guys just standing around not getting the full advantage of the drill doesn't, doesn't do anybody any favors. Knot tying is a necessary skill because uh, for the, the first and foremost reason is the life safety. Um, if we need to perform any type of rescue, you'd have to know how to tie a knot that's going to securely hold the person. And, and also we use knot tying because uh, we, we may have to secure equipment to some, um, some structure, some piece, or and also we may have to um, haul equipment up a few flights or lower it down a few flights of you know, floors. Ventilation. The purpose of ventilation is to remove the products of combustion, the, the heat, the smoke, uh, the toxic gases, the flammable and combustible gases. Um, if, if the house isn't ventilated correctly, the, the, the products of combustion can build up and as the heat builds up, that, those products can actually flash or cause a backdraft and if the firefighters are in that room or in that area, they can be seriously injured or even, even killed. So um, ventilation has to be coordinated because if it's done incorrectly also, you know, you can increase the size of the fire and not know about it. Uh, ventilation, if done correctly, will also assist the firefighters in visibility inside a fire. Um, friends of mine were, were, on the member, were members of the call department and they, they took a few years, but they talked me into joining the call department and when I joined, I joined it as a hobby and didn't want to become a career firefighter. One thing led to another. I, I became a career firefighter and rose through the ranks to where I am now. It's, it was not my initial goal when I was in my 20s, when I was you know, getting out of college and moving forward with life. Um, but I, I'm glad I made the choice when I did, and I, and I love what I do. I have a unique situation. I'm one of those guys that not only works in this town, but I grew up in this town. 
So my, my interest for the fire service goes back probably before I could talk. Um, I, I have a lot of vivid memories of the old firehouse down on Maple Street, which is where Walgreens is now, and uh, seeing the trucks leave from there, going on calls. Uh, my father and I lived on North Main Street for a time back during the early and mid-1980s, and being North Main Street, it seemed like the fire trucks were always going by. Ben Lyon, ben Lyon. So it definitely piqued an interest for me at a young age. Um, I used to go into the firehouse a lot, actually, with a, uh, a person who worked for my family's business at the time would take me there. I think it was every Wednesday we'd go to the firehouse and see the guys and see the trucks, and it just it really had an impact on me. It was really cool to me, you know, I had the red light in his car and just... He was into it, and I just always remember that. Well, I have been on the department for a uh, combined almost 10 years now, and it really has, it has an impact on all of our families. Easter, we had a uh, small little forest fire. Had to leave a party in Ludlow to come here. I didn't have to, I chose to. You know, we, we don't have to respond at night it's, if you're available. I made the choice that my services were better used here because Easter is a time when most people are out of town. They may not even know there's a call going on. I did, I felt it, it's my obligation to show up when needed. So yeah, you're gonna leave Christmas, you're gonna leave Thanksgiving, you're gonna leave birthdays, you're gonna be here on the weekends, you're gonna be here all the time, sometimes more than others, but you're gonna be here during a lot of important events and you have to make the decision. Is it, if it's a carbon monoxide incident, I may think twice if it's my daughter's birthday or I'm in the hospital with my wife, but if it's a structure fire and I know that my brothers and sisters are gonna be coming here to fight a fire, I'm gonna make that choice to leave if I can. In the back of your head, your husband, wife, son, daughter is leaving the house or going to work and you don't know if they're gonna come home every day. You know, it doesn't happen often. It's about 100 times a year in the United States. We have about 100 line of duty deaths, but you don't know where it's going to be. It could be small town USA or it could be New York City, the largest city in the United States. We have a small group of guys here during the day, but it's a really great group of guys. And, and even at night, we have, we have a fan, just a fantastic makeup on this department. Um, and yeah, it's just the best job in the world. Now we're, we're a brotherhood, so we, we do tend to hang around with other firefighters, mostly. Um, we, we get, to get, we get to, together for uh, birthday parties and uh, other functions, and we do spend a lot of time together. You know, we're working together, we're sweating together, we're crawling through burning buildings together, we're pulling people out of cars together. We, we, you experience a lot in times of stress. We have three engines, one ladder truck, uh, and two command vehicles. Uh, the, the engines are different. Two of them are set up basically for structure fires, uh, house fires, house alarms, uh, that type of calls, carbon dioxide calls. One of them set up as a rescue truck. It has our uh, extrication equipment for vehicle extrication or special technical rescue equipment. It also has our cold water rescue equipment on it. The, and the ladder truck is basically set up for to assist at structure fires with ventilation and uh, elevated uh, platform streams. Uh, we come in at 8 o'clock. Uh, we usually get here a little bit early. Um, we get our, uh, our gear on the trucks. Uh, we start up all the engines to make sure that they're working, run the pumps on all the trucks. Um, we have a meeting right off the bat with the, the, uh, the shift captain and kind of go over what we're going to do for the day. Uh, the process to get on East Long Meadow is you become a call firefighter first, uh, and then to go from call to full time, uh, you have to go through an interview process. Uh, the certifications are similar. You become what's known as firefighter one and two. It's firefighter level one and then level two. Uh, for on call, that is myself and the other full time guys here, we went through a program in house where our chief and other instructors taught us the firefighter one, two certification and then we went to test at the Mass Fire Academy. Now they have people go through an on-call academy, which is six months long. Uh, when I got hired full-time, that's when we went to a nine-week full-time academy, Monday through Friday. And that's what all the full-time firefighters here have to do. The Mass Fire Academy offers training programs throughout the year that 
any volunteer call or career firefighter is able to take, and 99% of them are free of charge to the firefighters. Uh, we encourage most of our firefighters who are encouraged are available, they can take the class. Uh, the unfortunate part is you saw metal that we don't have the budget that we can pay um, guys to take it so that it, most of the time it's on their own time. Our pay is it's hourly pay um, and then uh, anything that's after four o'clock is considered our overtime. Um, for the call members uh, they get a um, an hourly stipend so uh, whatever they're for per hour as soon as that tone goes out they're on the clock um, so that first hour they're here um, and then you know if it goes into the next hour etc but so um, call members are paid um, for each call and career guys that's considered their overtime probably the most memorable call would be the the, the car accident uh, that was on Shaker Road back in the mid 90s where two um, two teenage girls, sisters, were driving home and they, their, their vehicle was struck by a, um, a trash hauling truck and uh, the car burst into flames. It was just a terrible event. Uh, everybody that was involved from the fire department side and the police department side, I mean, the, the stuff we witnessed that day was just, it was you know, nothing we could have done to, to prevent that tragedy. And, uh, you know, I, you, people still think about it. I still think about that day. You know, it was just a bad day. The, the most notable call that I can remember, other than the, the big fire at Bluebird Estates, which everyone remembers, that there was a car fire, which sounds kind of silly. You think uh, the bigger the fire, the more dramatic. But it was uh, back in 2004, and I was on the uh, I was on the engine that day with my uh, friend Ben Cody, who's here today, and uh, somebody had actually parked a car. They had just fueled the gas tank parked the car on top of a brush pile, not knowing it, and th the hot motor caught the brush on fire, which caught the car on fire, and as Ben and I were advancing the hose line to the car, the gas tank let go. Like I said, the gas, had the tank had just been filled, or filled rather, and uh, the gas tank let go, and gas just dumped out of, from underneath the car and lit up, and it took a couple of pine trees with it, and it just, things got intense really quick, you know, and like I said, we were close to the car when it happened, so it kind of, you step back and catch your breath and go, <laughs> you know. It was um, about 12 o'clock, almost midnight, when, the, when we got toned out, maybe just after midnight. Um, I heard her come in and I knew the building because I had just been there a few days beforehand inspecting. And the way the police officer put the call out, it was a lot of fire and I knew that we were going to be working a long time. I turned from my house when I got in, get, going to get in my car, I turned and I could see the glow in the sky and I live about a mile and a half away from the facility. So I knew it was going to be a long night. I think it was about 18 hours before the fire was actually did, um, classified as extinguished. It was, it, was, it was quite some time. It was just, there was a lot of hot spots we were, we were fighting for a while. Uh, there was a firefighter who was working around the back of the building. No fire, no firefighters made entry into the building. The fire was too big. Um, there was a firefighter working around the back of the building, and he, because of the terrain, he, he fell into a, a hole and he, he uh, injured his ankle. Initially, it was uh, Springfield, Longmeadow, Summers, Enfield. Wilbraham, and then after that we had um, as far away as Westfield, where uh, Palmer came in, Ludlow came in, Agawam came in. So it was a, uh, it was quite a few other surrounding departments helping us. Um, I was in the back of the truck. I was riding. I was, I was the uh, captain at the time, but I was riding in the back of the truck, and everybody was getting ready to put their gear on and put their air packs on, and. I said to everybody, knowing that the, where we were going, that you're not going to need your air packs. Everybody's going to be an exterior fire. Everybody just stay away from the building. Make sure there's no, you know, nothing falls on you. And our goal is to get there. And the fire, that building was lost already. We weren't going to save the building. Just make sure it doesn't spread anywhere else, and make sure nobody gets hurt.